Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, fantastic webinar that has been put together by the Client Engagement Committee at the Financial Planning Institute of Southern Africa. My name is François de Tway. I'm your host today and uh, what a fantastic panel we have, a phenomenally amazing panel to have this discussion. Uh, I think, as I said, this is a fantastic uh, sort of uh, initiative that uh, they've come up with to say, well, let's take the six steps of financial planning and let's overlay on top of that some innovation and technology and have let's have that discussion uh, from, with people that are doing this in practice. So really looking forward to get into this uh, this afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for, for joining us uh, and uh, I guarantee you that you're going to get a lot of value from this today. It's an hour and uh, let me get right into this uh, and don't forget uh, that uh, you can also speak to the guests, you know, if you connect with them on LinkedIn and all of that, you're more than welcome to connect with them and have a discussion and see how you can take what they are going to talk about today, maybe a little bit further. So without any further ado, uh, let me introduce everybody to you. Uh, so I'm going to start at the top right. Uh, so I've got uh, Louis van der Merwe. So Louis van der Merwe, uh, Louis, just introduce yourself quickly. Uh, you know, who you are for those that don't know you yet, which I think is, is, is nearly impossible. Uh, <laughs> you're doing such fantastic work for the profession. Uh, but just do a quick introduction. Thanks so much, Francois. Hi, everyone. I'm Louis van der Merwe, based in Cape Town. Um, quite involved with the FBI, trying to get members engaged. I love having these type of discussions. I'm a certified financial planner and I've been building a business with our team over the last eight years, just figuring things out, trying to implement new pieces of technology and new ways of doing things for better client experiences. Awesome. Thank you, Louis, and welcome, and thank you for your time. Uh, Amanda, so I'm going to jump over to you. So Amanda, John is also joining us. Uh, Amanda, just give us a brief introduction of who you are and, and, where, and what it is that you do. Hi, everyone. Okay, I thought I'm muted. Hi, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well this afternoon. So yeah, my name is Amanda John, and um, I've been in the financial services industry or other profession for about 12 years now. I'm currently an account manager for the IFA Association at Old Mutual. So I work quite closely with financial planners and financial advisors, and I drive that value proposition for them. Um, and um, yeah, I sit on the board of the FPI, and I'm the managing director of Congealed Legacy, where we do a lot of financial literacy work. I'm also passionate about the profession. Um, I do some work with the FPI as well. And I think, you know, like Franch was said earlier, join us on LinkedIn, follow us on LinkedIn, because there's quite a lot of work coming in in 2021 as well, um, you know, in, in, in particular with the with the financial planning profession, especially for women in South Africa. So I'm looking forward to some of the work that we're going to be doing next year. And yeah, thanks. Um, thanks for having me, Francois. It's a pleasure, Amanda, and thank you for, for being here. And then lastly, uh, Russell Ho. Russell, welcome, and uh, just do your brief introduction. How's it, everyone? Yes, I'm Russell, and nice to meet you guys. And thanks, Rancho, for having me on your show. And yeah, I've been in the industry for seven years. I'm a certified financial planner, and uh, I've always been you know, interested and keen on finding different ways to maximize value for clients. And I'm looking forward to sharing a lot of my experiences and what I've tried and tested with you guys today. So hopefully you can take it back to your practices as well. Awesome. Welcome, uh, Russell. Nice to have you here. Um, so we've got a good mix of, you know, we've got the youth uh, and we've got the beauty, which is also youthful. Um, so we've got everybody on, on uh, this afternoon. And what is very important here is that everybody's going to be sharing some practical ideas and practical things that they've learned over time and things that they are experiencing every day. Um, you know, and I think we're going to talk about so much more than just the technology. So if you are here to find out like what tools and things that they are using, we will get to that. But I think this is such a huge opportunity for us to talk about so much more. So uh, with that, let, let me start out. Um, Louis, I'm going to start there with you. The, uh, you know, if, if we look at the six steps of financial planning, my first question to you, you know, because this is something we've been taught like many years from the time I joined the FBI, I know about the six steps of financial planning. It's an internationally accepted standard. And, uh, but I don't know, it feels to me like this thing has started to evolve over the last few years and it's becoming so much more than a step one, step two, step three kind of thing. What has your experience been and, and how do you see the six steps and where does that fit into, into the way that you work with your clients? That's a great question, Francois. 
I think the risk of having a formal step-by-step -step process is that a client feels like, oh, I'm just going through another kind of phase through you to get to an end. And, you know, the, the six-step process is actually the foundation of a 20 or 30-year relationship that that client's going to have with a financial planner. And when we talk about the experience that our clients have, we always want to say, is, is this a pleasant experience? And did we make it easy enough to start at the point where the client has this burning question? Because typically they come to you saying, I need something to be fixed. You know, and I think we, it's not a great experience if you say at that point to a client, oh, hold on, we're going to have to take you through this process. You know, you can blend it in. So almost seeing the, the process more as a framework with elements that you can start from and move in and out. Because as an expert, you're supposed to be pulling out information and building a relationship and doing multiple things, uh, almost essentially all six of the steps at the same time. So I think, yeah, that's, that's probably my take on it. Um, Amanda, over to you. Like, what is your view on on that? You know, if if we look at the uh, the six steps, um, you know, what is the experience working with so many financial advisors as well? Are things changing the way we approach this? I'm glad you've used the word experience because then you're really speaking to me because I've got experience uh, five years as a financial advisor before I did, you know, the few other roles that I've done in the last seven or eight years or so, and I can tell you now how I used to establish a relationship with prospective clients back then would be totally different to how I would do it today. How I used to gather data back then, what we used to call a fact-finding sheet. I'm like, why did I do that? You know, so understanding things differently, having had experience in the profession, having met so many people, having worked with advisors, having worked with a lot of other people within the industry generally, just in terms of what's the best way to do things, especially in how we engage with, you know, a prospective client. I would say things have definitely um, changed. Experience definitely teaches you to do things better, to enhance, you know, your, your approach generally to the six-step financial planning process. And I mean, I think on that note, I would definitely do it uh, very differently to how I did it as a financial advisor, you know, seven, eight years ago. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's definitely an important, um, you know, process. Um, and I think we're still going to get into that. But it's a framework built within the process itself. And it's so, so important in managing, um, you know, that process in terms of what advisors actually, you know, initially end up doing with, um, with their customers at the end of the day and how they maintain the relationship continuously post that process having actually been implemented. Yeah, so, so Russell, then I want to ask you a question. So I'm going to lead on. I'm not going to ask you for your opinion on that, but I want to, want to jump into the next question with you. Is that, you know, thinking about the topic for today, is it about automating and putting technology in place? Is that what, what like these steps are all about? Like, how can we, how can we make it so easy for people, you know, that it's almost the least amount of effort and technology takes over and it just does everything? Or what is this like, you know, how does that fit into all of this? Yeah, Francois. So yeah, I definitely agree with Amanda and Louis. I think, you know, first and foremost, let me just mention, it should be seen more as a framework because even I remember from my younger days as an advisor is that a lot of us as advisors make the mistake of using it as a tick box activity with the client, mm -hmm. you know, and we have that meeting where we meet the client for the first time and now we need to get 20 things. The first thing that comes to our mind is like, okay, I need to get all these different 20 items from the client in terms of information gathering. And it's actually really overwhelming for the client because they're meeting you for the first time. So with incorporating technology and automating that, I think we should look at technology as a way of enhancing or making it easier to ask those questions or gather information from the clients. But also first, most to first build that relationship of trust with the client before we start diving into that information and trying to actually understand more of the, you know, less quantitative of information of the client and more of them as a person. Yeah. And I mean, then Louis, so, so the question is then, um, you know, what are we missing currently? Like if we think about this process, Amanda said like, she can't believe that she did it this way many years ago, but we had to start somewhere. Right. And then as we go on, we learn like maybe there's a different way of doing it. 
you know, but what are we, what do you think we're missing currently? If I say we, I mean, most of the profession, most of the industry probably, you know, or certain things that have really jumped out at you saying like, you know what, maybe I should change this. It's not so much about that. It's actually about something else. So uh, from your point of view, what's, what's missing currently as far as the six steps is concerned? And I think specifically the first two steps. Mm -hmm. So if, if we look at what that first step is, right, it's about building the relationship with the client. And I think not that there's something missing. I think that the focus might be on the wrong element. It might be about telling them why they should trust us. You know, it might be about comforting them, saying, oh, we have all these laws and things to protect you. But to me, there's three really important parts in that first step. And that, that's actually trust, care, and commitment. You know, and how do you demonstrate that? Well, you demonstrate that by allowing the client to speak and you know, make them feel at ease and move at the pace that the client is willing to do. So I think that we forget that that should be the focus. Um, that's that's the part that I often uh, forget about. So uh, I'm sure everyone else sits in the same boat. Yeah, absolutely. Amanda, from your point of view? Let me just unmute. <laughs> I heard you there say she's on mute. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I definitely agree with um, with Louis on that. And I think in addition, I would say it's about building rapport, you know, because when you talk about establishing, and we need to remember what the first step is, it's about establishing the relationship with that person. And I think what we need to be aware of now is, and I mean, I'm talking even just maybe between myself and you, Francho, we've been talking quite a bit about saying, man, we should catch up, you know, and just get to know each other and grab coffee. We partly already kind of have an idea on, you know, like about each other. We've built a bit of rapport. We've established some sort of a relationship. And I think what's missing to answer your first question is that perhaps a lot of people or other, in this particular case, a lot of advisors, aren't uh, focusing on saying to themselves, how do I establish myself before I've even met my prospective clients? How do I um, you know, put myself out there? How do I drive my value proposition out there in such a manner that people who will in future get to know me might not necessarily wait for that first meeting to actually happen before they get to know me? So it's almost like auto building rapport with people out in the market, customers, consumers, whatever it is, before you even actually meet them. Because unfortunately, while technology is all great, it can probably make people say, uh -uh, this is not the kind of advice I actually want to engage with based on how you manage yourself on social media, you know, based on what they find when they actually Google you. So I always say be Googleable let your work speak for itself before people even meet you. Because a lot of the times you'll find when you do engage with a prospective customer for the very first time, and you're ready to you know, build that relationship, they probably already try to get to know, you know whether are you the kind of person that they actually wanna work with or probably not. Hmm. And I, I mean, for me, that must be one of the best things. Look, I'm an introvert. So from my point of view, that was one of the best things where people can figure out whether they like me or not, even before we've spoken, because that makes yeah. a lot of things a lot easier for me. But it's so much more than that, right? Um, and I, I must say, I agree with the things that you're saying. It's so important that, you know, you must understand that people are sort of looking a lot of things up from, from your point of view. Russell, I know you also have, you know, very strong views around this part, uh, sort of the before we even meet with a client or before we even get an appointment with a client. So talk to us a little bit about your, your view about that. Uh, yes, so I'm pretty strong about this topic. And, uh, you know, based on what Amanda said, I have actually have a term for it. You need to actually build social currency. You know, pre-COVID, it was already happening. And take the mentality or the analogy of, you know, if we go out to eat, right, and you're going to try out a new restaurant with your friend or your partner, the first thing you do is that you Google that restaurant. You Google that restaurant to see the reviews and to see what the food looks like and what other people are saying and whether, you know, it's a good decision to go and eat there. Now, what we're finding, and this was having pre-COVID, but even more so now in COVID and coming out of COVID, is that clients are Googling you to find out, okay, what type of person you are. And that's why I think it's really important to have some form of strong social brand and more so uh, social currency so that they can actually establish, okay, this is someone that I'm going to, you know, get financial advice from, you know, and I've actually had it 
quite a few times in the past where with a lot of my clients that I dealt with, they came to me after like the fourth or fifth meeting and they said, you know what, I actually have to admit, I kind of stalked you on social media beforehand. And because I saw the type of person you were, that's why I decided to set up the meeting with you. And I think that's the first part. The second part, you know, relating to what Louis mentioned on the first step of establishing that relationship is that you must bear in mind that um, taking into account all the tech tools and things we talk about, the technology and the tools aren't supposed to replace you as a person and the value you add in as a human being. You know, if a client wanted to just deal with you for the tool of answering some more questions, the long-term threat or problem with that is that eventually, you know, they can do that through a DIY to online or through robot advice. You know, you've got to put your value out there so that the client can trust you as a person because at the end of the day, they still want to do business with you because of you, not because of the tools you use. Yeah. And my question immediately that, that comes up because I'm not as young as you, you people <laughs> uh, at this point in time anymore. Uh, but the question I want to ask is, is this a younger person thing? Is it, the, is it young millennials, if you will, or, or younger people that would go and look for social proof and want to see that what you put out there is actually what clients are experiencing? Or are you finding that, you know, it's everybody doing that? Russell? Yeah, so it's definitely not just the millennial or the younger generation, as they call it. You know, I think it's all generations of all ages. I mean, I've had clients that are in their 40s and 50s that happen to come across, you know, my LinkedIn profile, you know, or happen to um, Google me through through friends. And you just, it's natural and human nature now where the first thing we do is like, if someone mentions someone to us and say, oh, so-and-so is so good at investments or at financial advice and you really helped me. You say, okay, that's a good person. I'm going to quickly Google them. And three things usually generally come up. Your LinkedIn profile, your Facebook profile, um, your Instagram, and possibly even your your personal website. And then that's how people can kind of get an idea of like, okay, this person's pretty good. They've got the same hobbies or the same tastes as I am. I have some relation with them. So I think it's a big thing of people now, no matter what age you are, are Googling you to see what type of person you are. And, you know, that's kind of, a bittersweet um, sensation about social media and technology today is that you can't hide, but at the same time, you can establish social currency and value to a person before they even get um, in contact with you. So I think that that's the first takeaway from this afternoon is that we've got to understand that we're busy establishing relationships or step one then, if you will, from the six steps way before we even know that that person exists. You know, so it's such an important part of how you want to go about this and and even if um, I, I had a discussion the other way with uh, the other day with somebody saying you know that uh, they were referred to someone but they first went and they sort of looked on social media like you know even so even though i think referrals are the most powerful way that we've grown over the years and the, the most preferred way that most advisors would want to grow even when that happens the person being referred is still going out and seeing looking for social proof and all of that so that footprint, I think, is very important. And, and that would fit into innovation and technology, I think, because there's a blend uh, between those two, two things. Louis, you and I had a discussion recently where you were talking about this, this move from being an expert to creating an experience. Um, it was very fascinating to me. So don't you just want to maybe quickly touch on that before we move on to the next section? Sure. So I think where it came from was five or 10 years ago, the main focus in financial planning was going to speak to an expert. You know, it's someone that could predict the next return or the best asset class or the best unit trust fund. And what we've seen is that with elements of behavioral finance and coaching, it's those things are becoming less and less important because clients understand that those are things that are outside of our control. And the financial planning industry has shifted to a client experience saying, how do we make this better for the client? Instead of saying, oh, how do I attract more clients? Let's view it from the client side, saying, if you're going in for first meeting, financial planning meeting, I don't know how many times you've had to tell someone how much you earn, how much you've saved, what you spend money on, that creates a lot of anxiety, you know, just thinking about that. So if we think about it from a client experience, how do we make that smooth and seamless so that clients actually want to engage with us? instead of that kind of fearful uh, approach where we're going to tell the clients, hey, you shouldn't be spending your money on coffee and you should be putting it into an endowment or retirement annuity. So 
just that industry shift um, from the focus of from expert to experience, I think is quite important. Yeah. Amanda, do you find the same? Definitely, I, I do. I think, you know, experience goes a long way, you know, and the whole expert thing, I don't actually even want to get into that thing. We're not going to stop. But I think I definitely support a lot of the stuff that um, Russell said, said earlier uh, with regards, well, rather to your, to, to, to your question about whether is this a millennial thing? Absolutely not. I mean, um, about 68% of people actually get general information on the internet. About 23% of that number gets financial information on social media specifically. So not, not just the generic internet, but rather social media. So um, it's, it's not about millennials, it's not about the young, but it's about saying even the older advisors, even the older customers that we're trying to get to out there are actually slowly starting to be a lot more tech savvy and in being innovative about how we drive engagement with customers, how we drive implementing of solutions needs to definitely accommodate that tech savviness. While not everybody will be tech savvy in the same, um, you know, like, for example, really understanding it exactly in the same manner and being able to use tech in the same way. But I think it's just applicable across the board. So it is so, so crucial. Mm, yeah. Um, so... Let's step off the six steps of financial planning and let's move on. And I want to talk specifically about uh, innovation. So, Louis, what does innovation really mean? I mean, if you, if you had to give a definition for innovation, you know, what does that mean? I think the way I like to think about it is that you forget about the old way of doing things, right? So scrap it and start with a blank canvas saying for where we are now, the tools we have now, the experience we want to create, what should this process or framework look like in even even think about 2030 you know what do we look like when we're 10 times the size of a business what do we look like 10 years from now and thinking about the future and trying to bring some of those smaller elements back in today instead of saying oh this is always the way we've done it because that's probably the the worst things that uh, someone can say yeah yeah no for sure amanda um and you uh, do you feel you know, how do you see innovation specifically i think in your space where you get to work with so many financial advisors as well i, I think you must see some pretty interesting things so so when do you when would you call something that's innovative versus that's just interesting it's big it's it's definitely that you know that um with all the work that i'm doing and i think well louis mentioned something interesting earlier and i thought that's exactly what innovation is and when he introduced himself he said um i together with the team are just still kind of like trying to figure it all out in the process they being creative in the process they being original in the process they figuring out what works for other people how do you make that working for other people better for your business you know and i think in working with advisors thank god you know i'm a i'm a certified coach and i always say and one of the RJMs who recommended me for this particular role about four years ago um, asked me when we started with the process and she said, so how are you finding it? And I said, we have, we're not even far, but what I can tell you is that the program has actually made me a better person because it's helped me learn how to engage better with people. It's helped me learn to how, how to identify better with different financial advisors in their different uh, practices. And I think the innovation for me in the work that I do on a daily basis definitely comes in there to say while the program or while practice management or client engagement or elevating the client experience may be the same and the processes that we used in doing certain things within our practices and following the six-day financial planning process, it's about how do you take it from a from an innovative approach to basically work for that particular client that you're dealing with, to work with that particular advisor that you are dealing with for their practice. So you just have to continuously be innovative all the time. So again, I mean, the definition says for itself, you have to be original and you have to be creative all the time. Yeah. Russell, from your point of view, um, how do you view down in Port Elizabeth? What, what does innovation mean down in P? So, when you mentioned that term and what innovation means, the first thought that actually came to mind was, of course, it's like, you don't have to make a new wheel, you can just reinvent the wheel. And that's the mindset I've always uh, you know, had since the beginning. And I think the big problem or the mistake a lot of us make is we looking outwardly for innovation when you can actually look inwardly to yourself and your practice. 
you know, my mentality since I've started in the industry has always been, okay, if I was the client, how would I find this process? How would I find the experience I'm having with you, Russell, when dealing with you? How would I find that? And that's what I work on first before I look at external factors. I would always work on innovating the client experience and I would say the client process and advice process for the client. And I think when we look at innovative tools and technology and all that, that should come secondary and you should think about it from a point of, okay, how can I use these facilities and these tools to enhance my value and experience that I give to the clients? And I think that's where we need to actually start first before thinking of like, okay, I need to go and buy this too, this too, this too, this too for all these benefits. And what you're actually doing is that you're not actually upgrading the value personally and inwardly that you're adding to the client or you know, um, improving that. You depending your value on external factors which you can't control. Mm. Something that is sort of really jumping out at me at this point is that, I mean, both you, Russell and Louis, you spend an inordinate amount of time, I hope that's the right word, but that's an immense amount of time on working on your businesses, learning new things, seeing what it, what people are doing overseas. I know both of you were talking like before the show that or before the webinar that, you know, you, you've been talking to people over there and like it's not in South Africa, it's it's all over the place, you know. So, um, and Amanda, it's your job to, to help advisors, you know, sort of do that and, and coach them through that process. Where do you find the time to do that, Louis? Before I get into my next question, just, you know, how do you go about like figuring out what this is and finding the time to be able to do that? Is it something that you were able to do right from the start? Or is it something that in the last few years that you've, you've sort of, because you've built your practice, now you have a bit more time? How do you balance that? Mm, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's no such thing as time management. There's priority management so it depends on what are, what is a high priority for you at this stage is it about starting up the business um because at, at that stage of your business you, you have to run around and do a lot of things so partly it's the luxury of having time but also it's putting that in the front face and saying well this is a high priority because innovation isn't something that you do today and then it's done you know this is something that we're going to be doing for the next 30 or 40 years so I see a part of every financial planner's job to spend time understanding tools, know what's out there, just like you spend time getting better at financial planning, understanding products, understanding the markets. These are all things that come to the mix. So I would say it's the priority management. Um, if it's something that you don't enjoy, then team up with someone. Find that person that this excites. Um, yeah, no, that's a that's a great tip, Russell. From your point, just quickly, um, you know, what do you, what do you, how do you view or how do you go about just you know staying on top of things and seeing what's out there and having different conversations because it does take a lot of time. How do you go about it? Yeah, so it actually took a lot of discipline and time to get into it. But within like the last three years, what I've done is I allocate the morning of my Saturdays um, every Saturday just to kind of do a strategy review section. So I review how the week went where I am in my business plan or my plans going forward for my practice, you know, and what are the lessons I learned uh, during that week. And, you know, another thing that I've learned as well is that we can have all these times or these plans for innovation and for to work on our practice and our business. But what's also important is that you need to tell someone, you know, you need to tell a colleague or someone within your LinkedIn network or a mentor um, for the main basis that, you know, they hold you accountable for that. Because if you tell no one about what you're going to do, then it's easy to give in and say, like, come end of the year and you haven't made any progress or reach your goals, you'll be like, oh, I'll just push it to the next year. So it's all about, for me, of allocating time within your schedule to work on your practice and outline the goals or what you plan to achieve within that hour period or that two hour period and how it's going to progress your business and innovate your business for the future so that you keep staying relevant. And the second thing I would just quickly mention is that you know, always check within your your network, whether it's on LinkedIn, which is a you know, fantastic, I would say, platform. Check within your network for colleagues that are going through the same processes so that at least you know you're not alone in your journey wherever you are. Mm, awesome. Amanda, so let's get a little bit into the innovation part as it applies to step one, which is establishing, uh, establishing the relationship. We've had a lot of discussion around that it starts way before then, um, you know, but 
what should be the focus of establishing the relationship? We, you know, what is it all about? I think that's sort of, I want to get to the essence of, it's one thing to say, establish the relationship. I think a lot of advisors see it as, I need to, I need to give them my statutory disclosure, my terms and conditions or my service level agreement. So it's all those things that are required by compliance. Um, but as we've now learned up to this point is that it's not about, you know, ticking that I've got to write forms that are signed. It's about so much more than that. So if we do that, one, what should be the focus and how do we innovate when it comes to establishing the relationship? How can we set ourselves apart when doing that? So, Francho, I love that question because uh, we talk a lot about the importance of the first meeting. In fact, before you even get there, the importance of the pre-appointment before that first meeting initially happens. And I think you've hit the nail on the spot there to say, um, you know, um, rather on, on the head, you know, to say, you um, the regulatory compliance things aren't necessarily what helps a client make a decision whether they actually want to work with you or not. Um, I think we've heard so many people say, you know, it's um, it's the, you know, perception that, you know, makes people actually either want to work with you or not work with you. And I think we've already touched on that in terms of how can you manage that on a social media front. But I think that first um, meeting with the client is so, so important. Again, it's not about the regulatory compliance. It's not about the disclosures. It's not necessarily even so much about your qualifications. While that adds a lot of meat to the expertise and perhaps the experience. But I think what you are about, what you do in your practice with your team, how you guys engage customers on an ongoing basis, following onboarding, you know, that client. People want to know what they are coming in for, as opposed to feeling like, you know, they're going to paint all the financial advisors out there with the same brush. It shouldn't be like that. We already know that there's a lot of preconceptions. So how do we actually go about demystifying that? And I would say when you sit with, you know, a prospective client for the first time, it's about making sure they know what kind of person you are. You don't have to spend a lot of time, you know, making that first meeting about you, but it's important to really, really get that right to say, get to know me, get to know what I'm about, get to know how I do my things, you know, get to know how I implement my process and actually know that I do have a process. I don't just leave things hanging or lingering within, you know, the framework of the work that I do and really then making it about the client. Because at the end of the day, while it's important for you as a financial advisor to ensure that you've got a you know, a, a, a framework or a process that you follow to making that decision, whether is this the kind of person you want to work with, you need to afford that prospective client exactly the same right to say, is this the kind of financial advisor I actually want to work with? So it means it goes both ways. And within that opportunity of that very initial meeting, it's about making sure that I've let this person know exactly who I am, what I'm about, what it is that I do, why I do all of that, and that I'm committed to my client's financial plans, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, so so if I can summarize, so in one word, sort of, it's, it's a, well, not one word, but in one sentence is that you're trying to determine a good fit or perfect fit, if you will. Because if that fit is not there, it may be the perfect client for you, but maybe you're not the perfect person for them for whatever reason, then it should stop at that point. So, Louis, how do we become, I mean, how can we be, like, how do we do this practically? You know, so it's, it's we talk a lot about what we should be doing and what, what we, you know, the things we should focus on, but how do we do it practically? Like, what are the, what, what are one or two or three things that you do in practice with a client to sort of make this a great experience for them when when seeing, do I want to work with this client and to give them the opportunity to do the same? Yeah, so I can share the way we've tried to approach it is that we have a chemistry meeting before we start this first step. And that's just, you know, getting to know each other. Um, what COVID has shown us in, in this era is that the likability of a financial plan is really important. You know, so a client has to, kind of like who they're going to be dealing with because you spend a lot of time and energy together. So that's important the, the, to kick off the relationship. And then when we do decide to move forward, to me, a great question is what would make this a successful relationship looking back one year from now? And that allows the client to tell you exactly what they're looking for. You know, how um, you can set yourself up, what the level of communication should be, the way that they like to communicate, um, how often they want to communicate. So 
I think just slowing down and asking really powerful questions allows the client to tell you exactly what they're looking for. And if that relationship can then be mutually beneficial, meaning that the client gets more value than they pay for and the advisor earns a decent income from that client, I think then, you know, that sets a really good base for a relationship to start from. So those are the kind of approaches that we've started to take. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, Russell, from your point, uh, you know, what are the things that you're doing that you think is different from the way you did it when you started? You know, what is what do you see clients are really responding to when you when you in that process of uh, establishing the relationship and determining that fit? Yeah, so um, I definitely think, you know, initially, and I felt that same way as well when I started our industry, is that a lot of us get discouraged because you know, we get labeled as policy salesmen and brokers and, you know, it's very discouraging. But I've learned over the time to actually see that as an advantage or a, I would say, a pro card in, you know, our, our pocket. Because at the end of the day, think about it, the majority of most clients, their expectation of an advisor is at this level. So it's really low. The bar is really low. So you have the opportunity when you meet that client and that client has a fantastic experience, you have the opportunity to really blow them away and give them a great experience that they've never experienced from any other advisor or you know from what they've heard so i think that first meeting for me what i try and do is i will similar to like louis it's also about building chemistry and trying to find out you know if the clients are good fit if we're good fit for each other and you know and find out what their experiences are so i always ask the client you know in this meeting don't worry it's not really that formal i just want to kind of get to know you and you can get to know me I want to know about the experiences you've had with financial advice or, you know, or what you've learned growing up. And more so, what I always do with a new client in the beginning is within that first meeting, I always find out what they do for a living. So, for example, if I'm dealing with a doctor, I tell the client, the moment they tell me that they are a doctor, I tell them, so I know nothing about being a medical professional in your field. But most likely the terminology or, you know, the concepts and the topics you guys speak about amongst your colleagues is like common knowledge. And likewise, I don't expect you to know anything about finance. So you can ask me any question you want, and there's no such thing as a dumb or silly question. And I promise you, you know, every time I've done that with a new client, whether it's a high middle income or high earning client, the amount of pressure and I would say tension drops from their shoulders because now they don't feel intimidated or feel embarrassed if they ask something silly or a uh, question that they feel or initially thought was a stupid or silly question to ask because you know they have this idea that oh he's going to expect me to know that you know so i always think it goes back to what i mentioned earlier i always think if i was a client okay i'm going to see a financial advisor and based on what the media's you know portrayed it's these guys in you know suits and I can't ask a silly or stupid question because I'm going to look dumb and he's going to give me a response of like, well, how come you don't know what inflation is or how come you don't know what an investment is? So I clear that all up within the first meeting within the client and I tell them, there's no dumb or silly question with me. You can ask me whatever you want to ask. Likewise, I know nothing about your medical profession, so I don't expect you to know anything about finance. And it's all about bringing it down to the client's level. And how I also usually end that meeting is, Another big thing is being fully transparent with the client. So everything about your processes, you know, how does the financial plan work? And I was going to, especially, which is a big topic nowadays, is how advisors earn and how I earn. That way you take in all the concerns and the hidden stuff that clients are initially worried or touchy about before they come to the meeting off the table and they can walk away feeling, okay, this guy's like really honest. He's been upfront with me. I know what I'm getting into. I'm looking forward to the next meeting. And that's how you also build trust with the client. Yeah. I want to ask you a quick fun question, Russell. So <laughs> in, in one word, how often do you get a, the if you if you're trying to determine if somebody's a good fit, how often do you get it wrong? Whoa. One word. Maybe not not point not one percent. Okay, awesome. So it works. That's all I want yes, to know. Yes, it works. <laughs> awesome stuff. All right, so let's talk a little bit uh, about gathering information. Uh, my my question then first to you, Amanda, is: Is it appropriate to ask information before we've established a relationship? Um, you know, so and maybe I'm just standing here thinking now, like 
at what point do you know that this relationship is it at that point when you decide like yes we want to move forward and it's a mutual decision i would guess that that would be sort of the signal that now we're ready to go into the next phase you know or is it appropriate to send forms and say please send me your assets and liabilities income and expenses and policies so i can be prepared when we meet so what you know what is your view on on that that's probably what I used to do eight years ago, 10, 11, 12 years ago, when I was first onboarded, you know, as an academy kind of an advisor, you know, you kind of get that, you know, disclosure and consent form signed and it's not necessary. That's not how we do things now. I mean, while it's important to gather enough information to be able to make that decision to say this is definitely the kind of person I want to work with just like on the other hand the client has enough information on you to be able to say this is definitely the kind of advisor that I think I've been looking for all along and I think some of the important things that could possibly come up and will help advisors to really determine whether is this the kind of um, client that I want to have you know in in my practice it's really understanding whether does that person have a financial advisor and I think before I even go on to that I think to 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 answer your question um, uh, Francois, it's not necessary, you know, to do the whole gathering of, you know, policies and um, see where they are all at, how much investments they have. Um, it's important to know that they have these things. And I think that can definitely come up in that initial conversation to say, so have you worked with a financial advisor before? If not, you know, what do you currently have in terms of, you know, knowing where your finances are at? Because you want to be able to establish whether is this the kind of person who's got that attitude that says, ah, well, you know what, I'm not the kind of person who keeps my eggs in one basket, therefore I've got a financial advisor here, I've got another one there, and that's the reason I'm talking to you. Personally, I don't think I would want to work with a person like that, but it's really understanding if they do already have a relationship with an advisor, why are you possibly wanting to move? What are you maybe not happy with? And I think to Louis' um, point around the question that he asks at the end in terms of how would you want to engage me? You know, or rather, what would you expect from me, you know, in a year's time looking back? It's exactly that same discussion to say, um, you know what, I do have an advisor. I'm kind of looking around. And the reason for that is because of A, B and C. You already know exactly what makes this person unhappy. So I think it's very important that while that initial um, session or meeting should really be just about getting to know each other. In getting to know each other, it's important to have enough information that helps you as the advisor make that um, decision. And I think it's absolutely not wrong to. And I think something I wanted to say when um, Russell was just, you know, kind of um, giving us a breakdown of what he does and the things that, you know, or rather the conversation um, that he has with his clients to make sure that they're comfortable, they've, you know, gotten the pressure off their shoulders and stuff, um, is really that an agenda is so important, you know. There's nothing more wonderful than an advisor almost clearing the air long before they meet with the client to say, listen, here's some of the things that we're going to be talking about. The reason we're having this meeting is really just to get to know each other. But in getting to know each other, I need to know where you are at with your finances without necessarily going into too much detail. That's still going to come in the second step, which really should be happening during that second meeting. So I think it is important to be able to gather enough information still at the first meeting just to give yourself that peace of mind that you've gotten enough information on the client for you to be able to say, is this the kind of person I actually want to work with or probably not? Yeah. Louis, so the kind of information that like, when we now get to that stage where, okay, now we can talk about assets and liabilities and, and all sorts of other stuff, and that's the all sorts of other stuff I want to get into with you is, you know, what information should we be, be, be gathering as part of the process? Francho, I think that should be driven by the type of relationship that the client is expecting. You know, the information that you gather, gather from a widow that just lost her husband it's going to be very different to the information that you gather from a business person getting ready to sell their business and on unlocking capital from that business. I think as the financial planner, our role has become to coordinate these things, to say, let's get in touch with your accountant and your attorney, if it's a business owner, to bring in the information and coordinate these things so that it speaks to your financial plan. And in that process, we're going to be simplifying your life and we're going to be building a financial plan that you can actually use. Whereas the client that have just lost their spouse, you know, we might be spending a lot of time just getting her affairs in order, actually physically shredding paper, 
putting a file together. And don't be afraid to go that granular because I think clients appreciate it when they feel organized and they feel like they actually know where everything is and see that as an opportunity to have a great experience, but also gather pieces of information that's going to help you develop a financial plan for that client. Yeah, you know, so it's it's not just about the facts, right? So it's also about talking about like, you know, the things that are important, you know, value determination, those kind of things. Because I mean, at what point does that come in? When, when do you start looking at the qualitative things and not so much the facts of things, what you have and what you want to have? But what about the things that matter to you? What about the things that are that are driving you? You know, so is that sort of should one start there or do you start with the facts or, or, or is it a mix depending on, on, on what you've just said? I think this is a process. You know, you, you find out where the client is now, you find out where they're going, but in that process, you build a relationship. I mean, you get to know that person, you get to understand what's important for them, but you can also not pick up these things if you're not listening or if you're not having specific conversations around what's important to them. So simple questions would be just asking them, you know, what's important about money to you? And then delving deeper into that. Why is having freedom with your finances important to you? So I think going deeper and deeper and deeper, and not in every conversation, you know, you'll, you'll pick up when it's the right time to do that. But these pieces can determine if a financial plan actually gets implemented. Because remember, we're not competing with other advisors. We're competing with a client doing nothing. The client saying, Actually, I'm okay where I am at the moment, even though that might be detrimental to their long-term financial planning. So whatever we can do to get them to take action and move closer to their financial goals, I think we almost have the obligation to have those conversations, even though it might not be comfortable for us or for the client. Yeah, so what I'm hearing you there saying is, you know, it, you've got to be flexible in your approach. It shouldn't be, I'm just focusing on this one thing um, you know, in order, like, this is my process. So I start here, then the next thing, then the next thing, regardless of, of what it is. Um, so, so you are very, very important. So um, I think I'm going to step off of uh, innovation. I want to talk a little bit more about, about technology, uh, which is maybe why many people have come as well. So they, they're looking for those golden nuggets of like, look at this tool. <laughs> uh, but I think if there's one message that before I do that, that I want to sort of share with everyone is that it's not about the technology. The technology is something that enables you to do something and to do it better, but we shouldn't forget about the person. And it's one of those things that I that I recently also spoke about. It's just you need to think about it when you know when you have this process and you follow this process religiously. Just be careful that you don't forget about the person and the human being, and be so set on the process that you miss opportunities to make a difference in their lives. Um, so with that leading, I was sort of want to jump into the, the the technology part, Russell, with you. Um, when we when we sort of look at establishing the relationship specifically again now, so this is about uh, as we said like before, like obviously social media and having a an online presence or having some form of marketing effort, and then sort of where now I sit with a client or we we're trying to engage with a client, we're trying to set a meeting. You know, what are the kind of tools and things that you use in your business, um, and how do you go and how do you decide when you decided on what technology to use? Just maybe a, a brief intro into like, what was your thinking? How did you choose what you chose? Okay, so yeah, I pretty much, I incorporate a few tools and my process is like 100% French on what you said is that don't let the tool, don't look for a tool to replace what you're doing or replace you. The tool is just to enhance the human value, and the human element that you add to the client. You know, so don't look for two of, oh, you know, I get a lot of questions of like, you know, Russell, what is the tool that's going to do everything for me? You know, or do my job. The tool is not there to do your job. The tool is there to enhance the value you add in your job to your clients. You know, so that's a very important thing that I would say um, is something we need to take note of. Secondly, when it comes to using tools or setting up the meetings, what I usually use and I start using as well is I use Canly to set up the meetings so that, you know, it sends reminders to the clients, it takes care of all the scheduling of meetings and so forth. Um, and there's no need for me to follow up and check in on that. It also allows me to block out time when I need to do other work related to other clients. So I use that to set up meetings. And then when it comes to gathering information for the client, I have the meeting with the client first and foremost to first build the trust. And then 
we start looking into, okay, what is important to you as a client? And then we take it from there. All right, cool. Um, Louis, from your point, uh, what is it that you sort of use? Uh, you know, I, I know you have a similar sort of approach to because you first want to make sure you want to work with this client, but then, you know, that process of, of getting the meeting, setting it up, you know, what are you using uh, to help you, uh, one, enhance the experience, but also make it easier for the client in certain uh, respects? Yeah, so what I've tried to do this year is to actually block out specific days where there's no client meetings, but then also like Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, there's three slots where clients can book for either a virtual Zoom meeting or meeting at office. Uh, we use Calendly. There's many different options depending on your preferences. We just found that it's one that works really well. If someone has to book a meeting with one person or even a team, there's round robin um, functionality. And then you can even link that to other software to then kick off, for instance, the next step. So you could have a client booking a meeting, it automatically sending an email to the client with a link to uh, Asset Map, the tool that we use that helps gather information. I saw someone asked about info gathering. So there's a discovery link. And then in your first meeting, planning meeting with the client, you can actually say, well, this is how you've captured your information. Let's just check that relative to what the actual information might be. You know, and there's different sources to get that from. So you're using this process as an opportunity to educate your clients. But for them, the tools become invisible. And I think that's so important because we can focus on technology, but a great piece of technology actually just feels seamless and the client doesn't even notice that there is technology involved. That That's such an important point. Like, you know, if it's not, it shouldn't be a, a hindrance, right? It mustn't make it more difficult for the client, it must make yeah. it easier. So they mustn't even know that it's there. I think that's such a, way, a nice way of putting it. Amanda, um, you know, in, in terms of the uh, establishing the relationship or even maybe let's move into the gathering information part, you know, uh, are there any tools that you that you sort of advise advisors to use or things that you've maybe used yourself that you think, well, that worked really well? Um, is there anything you can share with us in terms of that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think earlier when I, you know, started, when we started chatting, I spoke about the fact that I was introduced to what we called a fact finding sheet back then. And it was so doof, 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 you know, and now I think back and I compare with what I would use today and the approach we recommend the financial advisors that we work with, that we support, that make part of our IFA association is that, um, and you'll remember something I said earlier as well, that I think um, Louis touched on a little bit to say, when you, you need to understand why certain things matter to a particular client. And we talk a lot about when the why is clear, the how takes care of itself. And I absolutely, absolutely love this topic because it's the information that you have on your client that already informs you how that client actually wants to be dealt with, how that client's um, solutions need to be packaged together, how that clients want, how that client wants to be serviced at the end of the day. And I think it's in ensuring that the information that you have on your client, and again, this goes to that listening skill, that the information that you have on your client should not be about a fact-finding worksheet. It should be about really, really understanding why are these things important to this person? Why does this matter so much to the person? Because when you understand that why, like in all honesty, the how actually takes care of itself. I mean, a lot of the times we do researches or you get exposed to, you know, surveys and research that tells you at the end of the day, a lot of clients don't really care about how much the products, the solutions, the, you know, all of these things where that we have to offer them at the end of the day actually cost as long as they are there to bridge a particular gap or a need that is so, so crucial to themselves and their families and actually helps them sleep well at night. So one of the things that uh, we use in terms of just an approach, and yes, it has been integrated into uh, the CRMs and the FNA tools that we use within the business, which is XPlan currently, which has a lot of the Pareto principles really awesomely integrated into it. And we talk about form where we say really, which is really split like in two, where you need to understand the why and then the how comes later, which is really that money. 
you know, but it's important to get the why right first. When we say understand your client's family, their occupation, and their recreational qualities, which really embrace and encompass literally everything around around them and their lives and everything that they're planning for their lives. And all of that, you know, kind of falls of this FOR, which is really form, where we talk about the family, occupation, recreation, and then the money comes a little bit later. But all of that exercise is done so that you really dive into understanding why are these things important to my clients? Why is their family so important to them? And what's happening in that scope of family? What's happening in the scope of work or business? What's happening in the scope of things that I'm personally interested in. For example, if I told you as my financial advisor that, you know, in three years time, I'd love to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. You already know there's a financial need, you know, that needs to be attached to that. So I've already told you that I need that. How you help me get there is really by you understanding all the information that I'm giving you and why this thing is so important to me. So I think it's very important for advisors to really dive into that why conversation because that conversation helps them understand what is it that I actually need to do for my client at the end of the day. The client has already told you what they need. You know, it's about you listening and actually implementing to suit their needs. Yeah, amazing. Um, there's there's one thing I want to mention because we've had now. So, so Louis was talking about that they're using Asset Map. I know Russell, you also using Asset Map. Amanda in their business is using Xplan. And this is the thing that I see often when it comes to these systems is that, you know, often a system we think that a system can't do something. But often it can be sort of adapted and built into a certain way that can do some of the things where you need to make the decision whether a specific tool is really like going to be valuable for you is because it needs to fit your business. The moment you go the other way around where you're trying to to like, you know, just change your business so that it can suit the system. You're going to become frustrated. You're going to be, be like, it's not something that you would want to go through. Uh, let me put it that way. And uh, so very important that whatever system you have at the moment that also start learning about what the system can do speak to the people so whether it's at work or elite wealth or x plan or whether it's um it's 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 uh, asset map whatever it may be talk to them and find out like this is the things that you want to do in your business and if you don't know what those are then that would be step number one i would say um so so that's a good place to start um russell let's let's do a quick summary is there anything that you would like to add uh, to this anything that you're using things that are important to you and things that you see that the clients respond well to uh, and just maybe summarize a, a last point from 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 you yeah thanks marshall i think the last thing i would probably add you know i know most of you came to this webinar and for our future webinars to hear about you know these amazing tools that we're using and what i would you know in summary say is that you know there's a lot of good tools out there but you should determine like, okay, how is this adding value to not only me and my practice, but more so my clients and see it in the point of like, okay, if I had to position this towards my clients, does it simplify things for them, clarify and give them, you know, a clear path of achieving the lifestyle or what they want to achieve with their money. You know, it might be great for us as financial planners. And I know many of us like the technicalities or the numbers and all that, but you put that report or that output in front of the client and could and it could be completely overwhelming for them so i would say a most important part is think okay how is this tool going to add more clarity to my client and give them a clear sense of like okay now i know what i need to do to achieve this lifestyle goal that i'm working towards and you're going to help me work with it and work towards it you know i think that's very important so always factor that in instead of just deciding like i'm going to sign up for every tool that's out there and see it from you know a value point of view yes yeah awesome amanda last word from you something that you said um earlier but probably in passing and i think i'd like to just re reiterate on that that um, advisors need to make time to work on their business every day all of us work in our businesses you do the job you do the daily norms you know you get things done you engage with your customers but i think it's also about making time to invest in the how you do certain things. And I think Russell and um, Louis have 
kind of said that and proven that. You know, I mean, Russell says um, he makes time on Saturday mornings to review what is working for him or what's not and what he needs to do differently or continue to do and maybe do it even better. And I think Louis really said the same thing as well, that he sets a time um, two days in a week, if not one day, I think he said two days, you know, where he really focuses on the admin and everything else that he needs to do in the practice. It's important to make time to work on your business because there's so many processes and principles and tools and digit this and digit that, you know, that are all over the place. But if you don't almost take things and really compress them to suit how you want your things to be done in your practice for, you know, the betterment of your practice processes and for the betterment of your client experience, then, you know, you're not, you're going to kind of feel a bit short there, especially when it comes to client engagement and client experience, because everything that we do in the practices is so that you really get a good experience with your clients and you maintain great um, customer relationships. Good. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Louis, from you, your final thought, anything you want to add? Yeah, I think to me, the framework of thinking about the three parts in, in what you're delivering right to a client would be speed, price, and quality. And oftentimes, we want to use technology to make things faster, but you can only pick two of those three, right? So if you deliver something of high quality very quickly, it means that your price has to go up. If you take a long time, so uh, from a speed perspective, yeah, you pick on the price and the quality. So focus on technology that can look at each of those components, how to make things faster, how to make things less costly and how to improve the quality and you'll have a better outcome in your business and you'll have a better outcome for your for your clients. Oh, amazing. Uh, thanks, everybody. So I think it's been a fantastic uh, session this afternoon. Please look out for the next one. Uh, you know, the notices will be sent out. Obviously, we will post it everywhere on LinkedIn and hopefully we can send out an email to also advise members of the FBI. Um, so yeah, please join us then for the next in the series. We'll also be then be looking at step three and four, which is about the analysis and the recommendations. And uh, thank you very much for taking the time. If you're watching the recording, thank you for doing that as well. And uh, do share this with your colleagues, your friends, uh, your, anybody that will take value from this. Thank you to the FBI. Thank you to the Client Engagement Committee, Dintley and her team. Uh, you know, there's some fantastic people on that committee. Thank you very much, uh, Henry and Kobus Klein. And so Henry de Garanti, Kobus Klein, uh, Mariette Tappen. Uh, so all of you are doing a really phenomenal job. Thank you for what it is that you're doing. Uh, thank you, Russell, Amanda, and Louis. It was great chatting to you. Have a good one. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.